This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Excellent. Ready. Nice. All right. Well, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Sahar, Sahar who uh, comes from Iran. Um, so Sahar contacted us uh, in early 2019, and um, she has a, a vet degree from Shiraz University in Iran. And she did also some research um, in Iran on Staphylococcus. And she also uh, had six month um, period uh, in, of a lab placement in Texas in the US. And she contacted us because she was interested in doing a, a PhD uh, with, with us in our group. And at the time, uh, Amir had um, a research grant um, on um, microprocessing of yay. And we thought that's perfect because we had uh, the possibility to have a PhD candidate on this particular grant. So that was perfect timing. Uh, we organized everything and uh, we're ready to start and perhaps somehow uh, with us towards the end of 2019. And then something happened and, uh, and we had to wait and wait and wait for Sahar to come. So she's, she just arrived about a year ago and now she's ready to uh, give her, uh, her confirmation seminar after, after a very long wait for, for joining us and about 12 months of, uh, of working with us. So Sahar, um, if you want, you can take over. Yes. And hello, everyone. Thank you, Mark. You introduced me very well, better than mine. <laughs> and hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my confirmation seminar with this title, Molecular Basis and Stability of Attenuation of Live Mycoplasma Sinovia Vaccine. As you can see uh, in this slide, my supervisors are Mark and Emily, and my chair of committee is Christina. So, um, in this seminar, we are, I'm going to give you a bit background about my project, and then we move to aims and approaches. And at the end, I'm going to talk about the research plan, what I have done to, through these 10, 11 months, and what I'm going to do. So let's start with background. As you may all know, uh, Mycoplasma synoviae is a cellless bacteria, which is a significant avian mycoplasma species in chicken and turkey. This bacteria cause subclinical respiratory diseases, lameness, low eggshell quality, and overall low productivity and economic loss for the farms. The thing that is important with this bacteria is that the birds who infected with Mycoplasma synovia are susceptible for other infections. I mean, secondary infections, such as E. coli and some other thing, uh, bacteria, uh, which cause fatality and economic losses. Um, antibiotic therapy is not really working um, in mycoplasmas, especially in mycoplasma synovia, but so, still some um, antibiotics still working on mycoplasma, such as um, tetracycline, but truly antibiotic therapy does not completely eradicate the bacteria. So prevention and vaccination is the best way uh, to just, um, um, the best way for just curing these, uh, or I don't know, maybe, uh, working with this, um, back, uh, this bacteria. To date, we have two live attenuated vaccines, uh, commercially available, MSH and MS1 vaccine. So let's talk about MSH. MSH is the most popular vaccine for prevention of mycoplasma synovia infection. And it's registered in Australia since 1996, and it's utilized in several countries around the world. MSH is a strain that's developed by uh, chemical mutagenesis of virulent wild type Mycoplasma synovia 7NS in Australia. And it is a temperature sensitive strain, which means that MSH cannot grow in the 39 degree of Celsius, which is um, the te body temperature of the uh, bird. It will grow in a lower temperature, which, which is around 33 degrees. So it colonizes in the upper respiratory system and uh, cause a mild infection, which gives the bird the immunity against this, uh, this mycoplasma synovia. 
But uh, something that happened during these uh, years that people uh, are using um, this uh, MSH vaccine uh, was that um, the farmers use the vaccine, but they still complaining about that, okay, we are using this vaccine, but the birds are getting sick again and again. And is the vaccine still working or is it still attenuated or something happened to that? So uh, people in Afco Lab start to get some re isolates from MSH from fields and then uh, starting study on them to see what's going on. So the whole genome sequencing of MSS shows that there are 32 mutation in, com in this uh, strain in compared to wild type 7NS. And there are some notable mutation in MSS. One of them is OBGE, which is a gene that encoded a GTP binding protein from the GTPase superfamily. The other one is OPF, which encode a putative ATP binding protein of an ABC transporter. Some uh, MSH um, strains that uh, re-isolates that has reversion in these sequences of the OBG and OPF has two characteristics. Yeah. One is the loss of the temperature sensitivity, and the second one is the expression of wild type protein of OBG and OPF. And the other notable mutation in MSH is GAP-DH, which encoded glycer aldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, GAP-DH, a key protein in glycolytic cycle. So let's talk about GAP-DH. During glycolysis, uh, GAP-DH turned glycer aldehyde 3 phosphate into 1 and 3 diphosphoglycerate by reduction of one molecule of NAD plus to NADH. So this is the main function of gap dish that everyone mostly know about it. But um, something that maybe some people don't know about it is that gap dh working as a tet um, is like the structure of the gap dh is a tetramer within the cell. And in Mycoplasma synovia, it is around 37 kilodalton, but it is a moonlight protein, which means that it has some other functions beside its enzymatic activity some functions like adhesins or virulent factor. And there are some researchers that shows the presence of this um, protein in the surface of different microplasmas, such as genitalium, pneumonia, bovis, and hyaluronis. Uh, in Mycoplasma synoviae, there are two identical copies of GAP-DH gene in locus RS01150 and RS01365, which simply I'm calling them copy one and copy two. And both of these copies have a SNP in different nucleotides. So to understand it better, let's see at this one. The first line shows the 7NS GAP-DH. The second one is the first copy of GAP-DH in MSH. And the third line is the second copy of, MS, um, of GAP-DH in MSH. So you can see these points, this green one and this blue one, which shows that there are something different with others in this part. So let's zoom in. If you zoom in in the first part, you can see that at the position of 185 codon, you can see that that 7NS gap DH, we have an alanine, but it turned to the volume in the first copy of gap DH in MSH, but it still is an alanine in the second copy of gap DH in MSH. And, the, and when we zoom in on the other side, we can see that there is in codon 306, there is an arginine uh, in the 7NS GAP-DH, while it's changed to a lysine in the second copy of GAP-DH in MSH. So let's dive in a bit more to the details. So we can see here the GAP-DH copy 1 here and GAP-DH copy 2 here. Also, we have our strains here, 7NS, which is a wild type, and MSH, which is, which is the vaccine strain. So in codon 185, we have GCT in DNA in 7NS, which uh, encode an alanine. But there is a point mutation here, which changes C to the T in MSH, first copy. And then GTT co encode an evaline. So an alanine changed the valine into MSH in copy one. But uh, at, uh, in the codon 306, there is everything is the same in the copy one. But in the copy two, the position of 185 codon is the same in both uh, of the strains, but the codon 306, it had a bit different. There is a SNP here too. So in 7NS, we have AGA, but 
in NSH, we have AAA. So a G changed to the A, then an arginine changed to the lysine. Um, okay, I've talked about the reisolate from the MSH, and I want to add something here to do the previous um, part, which is the TS4. TS4 is a field reisolate of MSH, um, which has um, one copy same as MSH and one copy reverted to the 7NS. As you can see here, the down part of this uh, table, you can see that the first copy of the gap DH, it has the same mutation as MSH. So it has valine instead of alanine. But the second mutation in the second copy of gap DH in the codon 306, it reverted to the wild type. And it, it, it should be if it was MSH, it should be lysine, but now it reverted to arginine. And um, previously and recently, um, people in our lab used this um, reisolate in the, an animal experiment, and it showed the highest colonization rate and greater mucosal thickness. So it made us more concerned about this gap DH. And yeah, we knew that, okay, gap DH is an important part in MSH because both of these genes has a SNP and none of them in MSH has the same, are not the same as um, 7MS. But when one of them reverted to the wild type and this reisolate is getting more and more like um, pathogen. So we started to think about it. So gap DH may have a more important part than we think about it. So overall, the MSH copies of gap DH gene are not identical to wild types in wild types during seven years. But there are some questions here. Does this mutation affect the activity of the gap DH or what is the effect of these mutation on phenotype and attenuation of mycoplasmosinovia? And I think the best way to answer this question is to complement MSH with wild type molecules, which need genetic manipulation of mycoplasma and it is a beast being that for us because mycoplasma, as you may know, um, has a really, really small genome and there are not lots of tools like other bacteria to do genetic manipulation, but there are still some. Some people use transposomes, CRISPRs, and OEC based plasmid. In this project, I'm going to use an OEC based plasmid. And the difference between the OEC based plasmid with other plasmid is two things. One of them is the mycoplasma uh, origin of replication because these uh, mycoplasma cannot use origin of replication for, from other bacteria, such as this one that we have here for E. coli. So we added mycoplasma synovia whole um, origin of replication with all DNA boxes here. And it also needs another antibiotic resistant gene because mycoplasma are resistant to ampicillin. So we need to add one more uh, antibiotic resistant gene, with, which we chose to use PET um, here. So I'm going to use this kind of OC based plasmid, and I'm going to talk about it more later. So till now, you have a bit background about my uh, projects, and let's see what is my aims and, and approach. I think the first aim in my project is to answer the first question. Does this mutation cause and had any effect on the activity of the gene? So by to answer this question, we need to just uh, evaluate the enzymatic activity of gap DH protein in 7NS and then compare them with um, this activity uh, in MSH and TS4. Because I just wanted to know that the cost, this reversion in TS4, does it cause any difference in the activity um, between like MSH and TS4 or MSH and 7NS or not. So I think by, uh, by investigating the enzymatic activity of gap DH, we can um, just answer this question. Then I'm gonna complement the MSH vaccine with wild type gap DH gene. To, uh, and for this, um, by, you, by doing this, I'm gonna just check uh, the uh, if we, I can do the complementation or not, and then I will study different promoters. I will I will um, use three lengths of VLHA promoter, which is a really potent promoter in 
microplasma synoviae and also the gap DH original promoter. And this part of this project will give us two um, important uh, novelty, which one of them is we will produce novel microplasma synovia or C vectors, which everyone can use it. And then we can we also can use it in other researches. And also by using different promoters and different lengths of a potent promoter, we can regulate and adjust the level of expression of our proteins. After that, I'm going to investigate the influence of these gap DH mutation on pathogenicity of MSH in vivo. So I'm gonna just put these transformants from the previous part to in these beautiful creatures and do an animal experiment to see what is going on over there and does they have any effect of the pathogenicity and attenuation uh, or not. And the fourth aim, fourth aim of my project is to manipulate some parameter of the culture medium, such as NAD and glucose concentration, and then investigate the effect of uh, these, um, these concentrations in MSH population after passage in vitro. So uh, I'm going to just use a media, a media with different concentration of NAD or glucose because NAD is important. It is a cofactor for gap DH. So it, it is important for just doing uh, MSH and gap DH gene. And then I will passage MSH uh, within, with this, um, in this media and uh, just check, just evaluate and study the mutation rate by whole genome sequencing, and then evaluate the growth characteristics of MSH in vitro. And now here we are, and this is the interesting part of this project for me. Hopefully it is interesting for you too. Uh, okay, for aim one, which was the enzymatic activity of gap TH protein, I just wanted at first, I wanted to simplify everything to, for everyone. I think I just confused all of you by this copy one, copy two, these things. So let's give them an easy name and then talk about it. Uh, okay, in the far left, of this table, we have bacteria, 7NS, MSH, and TS4. And as we know, GAP-DH GAP has two identical copies in 7NS. It, in 7NS, it has one, uh, in amino acid number 185 is alanine, and in the position of 306, it has arginine. So I'm gonna use AR for 7NS GAP-DH for alanine and R for arginine. In MSH, the first copy has alanine in it, has valine instead of alanine, and it has also arginine at the position of 306. So we are going to call it VR. And the second copy, it has alanine, the same as um, 7NS, but it has lysine instead of arginine. So I'm going to call it AK, A for alanine and K for lysine. TS4 has the first copy, same as the first copy of MSH. So it has VR. And the second copy is the same as the wild type, which is AR. So I'm going to use AR, VR, and AK from now on a lot. So if you get confused or just feel yourself lost, just I'll put everything in the footer of the slide, then just look down and you will understand what I'm talking about, hopefully. I think the first step for understanding the gap TH activity was for me was to understand the structure of the protein. As I mentioned before, um, gap TH is a tetramer. And this uh, picture that you can see, it, you, you see here, is a monomer of this tetramer. I just um, changed the ang angles of these, uh, just because I wanted to show you something. I was curious that where are these mutations? Are they just hide in the structure somewhere or they exposed in somewhere important? As you can see here, um, this arrow shows the NAD binding site. So here is the NAD binding site of the um, GAP-TH um, protein. And this part is uh, the, um, and this part is the N terminal and this part is the C terminal of the protein. Let's see what happened in VR. In the left, you can see AR, which is the wild type, and in the right, you are seeing the VR, which is the first uh, copy of gap DH, the first protein, the first encoded protein from the first copy in MSH. So as you can see here, in AR, we have alanine here, and an SNP caused 
a change from alanine to valine in VR here. And as you remember from before, you know that this is the NAD binding site. So this mutation is not hiding anywhere. It is exposed really well in NAD binding site. And what happened in AK? In AK, you can see in the left, the AR, the wild type, and the AK, the MSH type. In the right, and you are seeing that in AR, we have arginine at C terminal, and we change to lysine at C terminal again in the MSH type. Now we know that where are these mutations. So it's time to just go and measure the enzymatic activity of GAF-DH. So for the, just trying the, the kit that I used for and checking enzymatic activity, I needed recombinant gap DHs. So I used three genes, gap, three gap DH genes, including AR, VR, and AK, and ligated to the suitable uh, vector and then transformed them into a suitable cell, competent cell. And after that, I needed to express them as everyone do. And as you can see here, we have uh, these three um, um, proteins here. These are cells, clones actually, that we made them express. And this is the band uh, of our desire and uh, a protein around 37 kilodalton, which nicely expressed. And after that, I just purified them and we have got lots of proteins during purification, which was really good, but I need to just wash them and make sure that there are no reagent that's unwanted over there. So I need to dialyze and I need to do dialysis. And here is uh, the proteins after dialysis. Yes, we lost lots of proteins, but at least we have like few ones. And the first one is VR, AK, and AR that we have here. And I need to quantify my proteins and make sure that I am using the same concentration of all protein in the kit. So I've tried a spectrophotometer and nanodrop and then check different dilution of the uh, um, protein on uh, STS, by STS page. And here you can see that uh, I just <clears throat> run uh, four dilution of each protein and then compare them the, the size of the band, compare them, the, the, I don't know, maybe the thickness of the band. I compare them and just make sure after doing a spectrophotometer and nanodrop that they are at the same concentration. And now it's the time. I use gap DH activity assay kit from APCOM and just follow the int instruction. It gave us everything and it also it gave us a formula, which is this. And these are the parameters that use this in this formula. And at the end, we had one unit gap DH activity equal amount of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase that will generate one micromole of NADH per minute at pH 7.2 at 37 degrees. And I have done lots of experiments to just optimize this kit. And then this is the one of the best uh, experiment that I have done. So I'm gonna present the results here. So for this experiment, uh, I decided to use five concentration of my proteins from 0.2 to 0.025 mg per ml. I use triplicate reactions. And I just wanna mention that these are technical reactions. And, and technical replicates, not um, independent replicates. I do not have the independent replicates yet. And uh, I use single proteins like AK, VR, and AR. And also I use the equal combination of proteins, VR and AR, AK to mimic the situation in MSH and VR and A AR to mimic the situation in TS4. Here is the standard cap. And first, I'm going to present the uh, single protein results for you. Something interesting that we saw here was that VR is completely inactive in all concentration that we have used and, and in all experiment that we have, we have done. So VR is completely inactive. And I just want to remind you that VR is the one that had the mutation in the NAD binding site. 
So maybe this mutation cause, I don't know, maybe this cause not connect, not binding well to the NAD or no, even something happened over there and then it cannot bind to NAD anymore and then it is inactive. AR, the table and the um, graph is also color connected. So if you're looking at the blue column, it is the blue uh, line in the right side. So AR is the um, white type, which always followed a really smooth pattern, as you can see, smoothly up and smoothly down. And AK was always um, surprising, like sharply increased and sharply decreased. And at some point, it has highest activity than um, AR even. So it seems that um, even VR is inactive, but AR is hyperactive. So this mutation has also effect on activity too. I mean, in VR, it causes inactivity, but in AK, it causes hyperactivity. So let's see and the um, combinations that we had. We had VR and AR for mimicking the situation in TS4. As you can see here, this yellow line is TS4. So VR is completely inactive and AR is this blue line, which is high here. So it seems that combination of VR and AR together, it is not inactive, but it's not as active as AR by itself is. So something happened over there. Maybe they are just uh, binding or making this tetramer structure using one um, monomer from VR or two monomer from AR, I don't know. But uh, yes, something is absolutely happen over there. And also we have this green um, column here and this green uh, line here for mimicking the situation in MSH, VR and AK. And just want to remind you that VR is the inactive one, but AK is this hyperactive one. And combination of these two, it is here. Sometimes it is also more activated than AK itself. Um, but I think in totally it's not as active as AK by itself, but I think at the end it's like more active. So I tried, uh, yeah, I think just talking about this thing, it, this interesting result is really good, but just when you think deeply, it is really interesting to find out what's going on in the cells. So I used cellulizate to just check the activity uh, by this kit. And I just make sure that I'm using the same titration of each cell, 7NS, MSH, and TS4. And as you can see here, MSH has the highest activity. I just want to remind you that MSH has VR, which is inactive, and AK, which is hyperactive. And here you can see that this green column has the highest activity. And beside it, 7NS is always smoothly over there, like not hyperactive, like this, not inactive. And TS4, which has VR and AR, it is also less active. Um, how can I say that? Less activity than uh, 7NS and uh, MSH. So TS4 has VR, which is inactive, and AR, which is active, but it is the wild type. So the combination of these two is, uh, even in the cell, it seems that is not as active as 7NS, but not disactive, deactive. So I know that these two graphs might not be um, really comparable, but just for foreshadowing, remember that these are our proteins. AR is um, the wild type, which is in 7NS. The VR and AK is to mimic the MSH, and VR and AR is to mimic uh, the situation in TS4. And I think they are completely in line, uh, just foreshadowing, not comparing directly. But yes, it shows that this combination of VR and AK, a non-active and a hyperactive cause um, hyperactivity. And something that's really interesting for me, if this combination has these types of activity really higher than even uh, the wild type, why in the field this reisolator revert that, that hyperactive thing to the AR, which caused 
activity. So it seems that it's prefer lower activity than hyperactivity. So yeah, um, I think this is really, really interesting for me. Maybe, I don't know, the hyperactivity of this gene is toxic, toxic for the cell, or maybe it causes some product, um, productivity or maybe it produced something that it is a toxic for the cell. So it's preferred to revert it and has lower activity than higher activity. And yeah, that's it for this um, aim. And the next aim was to complement the MSH vaccine with wild type gap DH gene and study different promoters. So yeah, now we know that gap DH activity is affected by these mutations. So I think uh, now we knew that this is important and we are trying to complement the MSH uh, with the gap DH wild type to see what happened over there. Even we just give um, the wild type gene to the um, MSH, maybe something different happened. So yes, um, I have four different con uh, plasmid constructs. The first one is um, it has, um, the, all of them has the same background. Uh, they have origin of replication for E. coli and Pisilin and also origin of replication for Mycoplasma synoviae and TETM for um, replicating in Mycoplasma synoviae. And uh, yeah, the first one is the gap dh native promoter that you can see here. I use gap dh plus P. It means that gap dh wild type plus its promoter. And the uh, next three um, constructs will have the VLHA promoter instead of gap dh native promoter. I think I've talked a lot about VLHA, but I didn't even, like really explain it. So let's talk about it. The VLHA promoter is a really potent and powerful promoter in Mycoplasma synovaria, which tested before. It's what it may cause overexpression in our uh, protein of desire. So we are going to use different lengths of this promoter to see if we can regulate or the expression or not, or, or if we can just induce the uh, or induce and stop the regulation or not. So we are playing with the expression here by using different uh, lengths of VLHA. So I'm gonna use, I mentioned that the background is the same, but uh, gap dhv one means the VLHA um, full, promo full length promoter with gap dh wild type. And PVLHA2 means the uh, mid size of the VLHA promoter. And PVLHA3 means the uh, short size of the gap DH, uh, of the uh, VLHA promoter. So I've already um, used Gibson assembly to just assemble these uh, constructs and they are, they are ready now. And then um, I just put them in E. coli and uh, check, oh, sorry. Yeah, I have checked the colonies by PCR first. So this is the lens of gap DH plus its promoter. And in the second, from the left, you can see gap DH from VLHA full size. And the third one from the left, gap DH VLHA um, mid size. And the far right is gap DH VLHA uh, with the short size. So yeah, I checked the colonies if they get our plasmid. So I just check, um, do the PCR for these uh, parts of the plasmid and then we send them for the Sanger sequencing and yeah, everything is all right. And now our cologne, uh, E. coli cologne are ready. So the next step for me is to just extract the plasmid and complement the MSH with this wild type gap DH. I've already prepared the MSH competence cell and transformation uh, to the MSH is the next step. And after that, I'm gonna try to express gap DH in MSH. And uh, for the, um, um, gap, gap DH promoter, we, extend, we expected the native expression, uh, but for the VLHA ones, we are trying to just regulate the expression. Yeah, and this is the next step for me. Let's take a look at AIM3, which is the investigate the influence of gap DH mutation on pathogenicity of MSH in vivo, uh, which I'm gonna do an animal experiment to evaluate the pathogenicity of the transformant transformant from um, the previous part. 
And then obviously we need uh, something to compare the results with. So we need some groups to inoculate with 7MS and also MSH. And something that are important for us after uh, by uh, doing these animal experiments are colon colonization of the bacteria. Where is the bacteria colonized or how um, much these bacteria colonize? And grass and histopathology lesions. And yeah, that's it. At the end, I just wanna say a quick thank you to Mark and Ami, my supervisors. My dear friend, Sarah, thank you so much. You really helped me during these 10, 11 months that I'm here. I wanna say thank you to APCO lab members, especially in Verity. They are always be there and help me a lot. I'm happy to answer some questions. All right, that was very nice. Uh -huh. um, all right, so uh, the prize of important questions. Um, we had just had one comment on the chat. It's mm -hmm. pa Paola, who is jealous of your uh, uh, impressive amounts of protein that you managed to, to produce. Yeah, I we think. were surprised too, <laughs> Paola. <laughs> At the first time, we just, oh, what, what's happening over there? Lots of protein. <laughs> I think a dash of luck will help. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I'm a lucky person. <laughs> All right, any question? Anyone who wants to uh, or have a comment or something? Just letting the look if people are raising their hands. So while people are, are thinking of a question to, to ask, maybe a, a quick question, Saha. You mentioned that you are going to use three different length of promoters. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a bit more about the, the rationale behind choosing this three length, because clearly you did not just arbitrarily decide of uh, three different lengths. You have, there is a bit of a choice guide, or a bit of, of uh, reasoning guiding your choice here. Yeah, sure. Uh, because I think in some uh, previous experiment that we have used, I think APCO people done here, but I think I had done it, uh, they used this VLHA promoter. So we previously know that uh, by other um, papers, they mentioned that, okay, VLHA is really important uh, in microplasma synovaria. And um, VLHA promoter is, we knew already that, uh, because I think Amir has done one paper on that, that um, VLHA has a, is a really powerful promoter. But uh, uh, I think um, Shahid used it for expression of OBG and then it's, it's overexpressed. And then we are confident that it, it helped the expression, but it may cause overexpression. So we thought maybe by cutting some parts and just use three uh, uh, lengths of these um, uh, promoter, we can just regulate even higher or lower um, ex expression in uh, the bacteria. All right, I think Sarah had a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, Sarah. Uh, very well done for your great presentation. Um, you might have mentioned it in your talk and I missed it, but I was wondering um, how or if you have any plans of checking how much gap, gap TH is actually being expressed between 7NS and MSH and TS4 because, um, yeah, we, we don't know actually how, what is the ratio between the two copies of uh, gap TH? Yeah, that's a good question, Sara. Thank you. Um, you mean in the cell, yes? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I'm going to do that if I got enough time. I think it's better to just find, uh, to just check it with Q, uh, RT -Q PCR. We can do that. And um, it can give us that, uh, okay, are they, the, are they just equally uh, combined as I've done in my uh, like experiment, or are they like just maybe one of them is lower than other one or maybe one of them is not expressed at all so yeah I think it's a good idea and I will do it if I've got time yeah thank you uh hi Saha just a quick question sure uh are you going to uh just transform mycoplasmas with the your constructs mm -hmm. and how about the gap dh that uh, mycoplasma by itself is expressing. Uh, you, you're saying that, how can I just um, find out that 
which we, which one is my um yeah. gap yet? Yes, yeah. yes, because you are going to you know just you transform your mycoplasma with yes. a construct and then mycoplasma by itself expressing the gap yet as well. Yeah, I'll, I also I yeah. also have planned to uh, just prepare some um, plasmid with his tag. So after that, I can just uh, pure them, uh, purify mm -hmm. them by using his deck. I okay. think this is my plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Zaha. Good talk. Uh, very Hi. good presentation. Uh, I just have a quick a quick question. It looks like um, the overall gap uh, DH activity uh, for MSH is even higher than 7NS. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Is that but for the first copy is um, we can see there's pretty much no activity, right? Yes. Is that is that possible that um, the second copy is actually expressed more than the first copy? So it's a complement. It's complementing the function of the first copy. Yeah, that's and that's a good idea. Even I think uh, I can answer this question after doing this RTQ PCR to understand that which one is more expressed. But something that's interesting and I think I can say in this situation is that AK, which is the second uh, copy, is also hyperactive when it's just by itself, as you can, as you saw in the uh, graphs. Uh, do you want me to show you? Let me just see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Maybe that's right. That's that's right. But here you can see that this is AK by itself, which is yeah. the second type. And it is hyperactive by yeah. itself too. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know. Maybe it's because of the the the, the amount of expression, or maybe it's by its nature something happened to it. Yeah. 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 So later but on, it is. Yeah, but it is not as active as the combination, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Maybe the combination these um, the combination of these two it's just caused more hyperactivity. Yeah, it's yeah. just very interesting here. Yeah. Um, so later on, you're going to play with some parameters in the media to check the growth of yeah. MSH, right? Yeah. So you reckon yeah. because the, the mutation occurs in the um, NAD binding region, yeah. so you reckon if you uh, play with the NAD concentration, it would um, have some effect with the MS, MSH growth? Yes, I want to just evaluate that because I know that NAD has um, it has a really important part in like the function of the gap DH. So I just want to see if I have different concentration of NAD and then um, like passage the MSH to just let let it to just um, um, get the adapts to this situation. Does it cause any? Um, like interesting uh, mutation over there in the gap DH gene or okay not. yeah all right thank you thank you well done thank you Lane uh, just a um, maybe a little bit of comments side comments um yeah addition of um, let's say NAD or, or additional NAD in the culture may not necessarily change anything um, yeah. uh, but um, we can actually look at the utilization of NAD um, in the medium between MSH and let's say the wild type. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Amir. Sarah, Sorry, it's turning to a discussion more than a question. It's supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, Two minutes. I was just... Thank you. I was just thinking of uh, what I saw in uh, metabolomics when I compared TS4 and MSH, and it seems that TS4 was actually having a more glycolysis, like an, a more active glycolysis compared yeah. to MSH. Mm -hmm. um, now, this kit, how does this kit uh, measure the gap DH activity? Is it uh, based on NADH production or? Yes. Yes, Sarah, it's based on NADH production. It is it is something like that. You gave NAD at substrate and then mm -hmm. let it be in 37 degrees uh, for a time that you need to optimize it for every um, experiment that you have done. And then you can just 
objective results. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is based um, on NAD product, NADH production. Right. right, okay. So, yeah, maybe we need to talk later before. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it seems to me that maybe the it's just gap DH activity in terms of um, NAD um, sort of incorporation, not really in terms of uh, an active enzyme in glycolysis. You know yes, what I mean? that's right. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. And I was thinking about that because we have another mutation in the C terminal, which is also a glyceraldehyde triphosphate um, um, a binding site. So we don't mm -hmm. know if that one is also um, caused something or not. Yeah. yeah, very good point. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. I think that we are running a bit uh, out of time. So it was a thanks for all the participants to this meeting for their lively conversation. We can keep uh, having a chat with Sahar maybe and uh, and uh, do a bit of brainstorming uh, for what's going to be the next uh, very productive, at least two years of PhD, if, Hopefully. if, uh, <laughs> if you want to stay with us, All right? Um, so we just have to thank Sahar again for her presentation. And thank you everyone for, for coming. And I think that Aaron Hughes, Hughes 